Hello? Hi. Hi. Uh, looks like Asaf is here. I'm going to be listening in the background as I will be working. Good. Hello, Asaf. Uh, my knock. Hello. How are you? Mayuk. Uh, Stanislav. Stanislav. And yeah. So Stanislav, I don't think you've uh, been in a meeting. There's Susan. Would you mind introducing yourself? I don't know if he's on. Um, well, anyways, welcome to the meeting. Um, so I, I guess Shruti was supposed to be here and she was going to give a talk. I don't know if she's going to uh, make it for today, but we'll see. I was on uh, I think machine learning art, so we'll see if, if she comes by and uh, shows up. So this week... So we already started our uh, 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 Google Summer of Code applications for this year, and we're getting some good feedback. We're getting some interested people. Um, let me go through some of this, and then we'll talk a little bit more with Mayuk about it. So uh, let me share my screen. OK, so the first thing to announce is that DevilLearn 0.2.3 is now out. And it's ready to download. We've been, re uh, like I said in some of the previous meetings, we've been releasing versions of this. Uh, so this is the Devil Learn, so the core Devil Learn software, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it in the meeting, uh, or yeah, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later in the meeting when I go over the flash talk I'm going to be giving for uh, the education conference this week. So this is the. Uh, Evil Learn 0.2.3 was released February 6th. So congratulations to Mayuk for getting that out. Um, so we have on the GitHub repo, we have 22 stars, 13 forks, and one open issue pull request. Uh, so this is just always refreshing. The idea is, is that we have a lot of activity going on. And so if you've not seen the uh, notebook for the Evil Learn package, you know, it's it's a program that allows you to segment cells and uh, analyze the data that uh, is outputted from the segmentation process. So you can plot them in a three-dimensional plot. You can get a distance matrix. And then you can try different versions of, uh, seg you know, different techniques for segmenting things. And so this is an importer in Python, and you can run it, and the instructions are here. And we also have packaged with this some pre-trained GANs. And Mayanak has uh, contributed uh, some additional training to this model. So it's a pre-trained machine learning model that uh, allows one to identify, it makes it easier to identify uh, cells in an embryo. So uh, let's see, then the pull requests. So we've had a number of pull requests in the past few weeks, we've had, uh, let's see, we've had quite a few, actually. Let's see, let me get up to the point where we were. So, uh, Arthur Ngonda, or Ganwa, he's uh, been contributing to this repo. He's made about six pull requests, so thank you for that. Uh, that's, I think, what part of what went into 0 0.2.3. Uh, so there were a number of uh, uh, support modules and things like that that went into this. So this is something that is, of course, one of the uh, Summer of Code projects. So if you're um, looking forward to uh, applying to Summer of Code, uh, please let us know through the channels. Through We have the Neurostars channel, which is the I think I mentioned this in the email, which is the um, sort of the main uh, INCF portal. So if you go to neurostars.org and you uh, 
put an, uh, build an account there, you can access the projects. I think it's Project Series 3. So it's uh, Project 3.1, Project 3.2, Project 3.3. And all of those are, um, you know, we have the Devo Learn project, which is what I just showed you. We have a project involving um, segmentation of uh, diatom images. And then we have another project, Digital Microspheres, which is, it's, it's a, uh, we have data from a, uh, Susan's Flipping Microscope, and that involves uh, uh, other organisms such as uh, axolotls. So that's, so apply to those by, I think the deadline is coming up um, at the end of March. You'll have to check with the deadlines to be sure. Uh, contact uh, Myok or myself or Ojawal Singh. And if, especially if you're interested in project 3.2, you wanna contact Ojawal Singh and we can help you with the application process. Okay, uh, so my ex says Minoc actually upgraded the GAN. So yeah, it, it Minoc upgraded the GAN. He's been talking to me about doing some training with larger data sets, but I don't know if that's been implemented. Um, so, oh, there he is. Uh, our so thing, actually, but, yeah, what was implemented? Oh, was it? Set of images. Okay. So, and also like the model is new, so it, it returns higher resolution outputs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's like four times the pixels now. So it's more crisp. Okay. All right. So it's up the resolution of what we can output as a segmentation. So, uh, do we have, uh, let's see. We have a new member here, uh, Arthur Ngoda. Uh, could you uh, introduce yourself? We're making some good commits on uh, GitHub. Am I on? Yes. Yes. So, so hi, uh, my name is Arthur Ngoda. So I am. Uh, a second year sophomore in uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Varanasi. So I like the project. So uh, I was thinking of contributing it, contributing to it, and also being a part of the TSOP twenty one batch. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Uh, welcome. So we. Hello. Yeah. That's why your peers. They're helping us a lot. Yeah, yeah you're helping me too. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and uh, my knock, yeah, my knock is is doing the pull requests for that. And um, so, yeah, if anyone has any questions about an application, application wise, let us know, um, and we can help you through the process. It largely just, you know, I mean, there's going to be a lot of scheduling where you have to figure out the schedule for things and how they are going to be implemented, and uh, you know having some now background knowledge of some of the things in the group are, are good too uh, we can give you some reading materials there's a website of course and there's a, a aside from the github repos and those will help you um, along and let me type in the website here so that's our website for the project and that should have a lot of the papers and a lot of things from maybe you know, uh, two or three years ago, where, which might be relevant to your project. So, that's good. Um, do we have any announcements before we move on, or? No, not from my side. Okay. Okay. Jesse or, or Minoc or Susan? So, yeah, congrats on the, um, the progress on the Devo Learn side. Um, it looks like that's going to be probably a pretty nice thing this summer to get into. 
Um, so that's, uh, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Okay, Jesse's mostly listening in today. Well, welcome. Um, that's it for now. I'm going to come back to DevoLearn uh, in a little bit in this flash talk. I'm going to talk about submissions, our submissions list that we talked about a couple weeks ago. So let me share my screen. Okay. And uh, we have a number of things on our list. I, I think this is probably incomplete because we haven't updated it in a while, actually, as it looks like. So we have a number of things that uh, are upcoming possible submissions that we can make to different uh, venues, to different conferences. And this is where we put them in this in this file. Um, this is just a way to keep track of deadlines. And then, you know, if there's a deadline coming up, we'll put something in the um, Slack channel and then people can contribute to them as they see fit. If they're interested in contributing, if you're interested in contributing, uh, you might uh, jump in the Slack channel you know, if, if someone puts an abstract in there or a paper link, you can join in and make comments. And there's a, I have a pretty liberal uh, authorship policy. So people, you know, you'll get authorship if you make a decent sized contribution. Um, and so that's, that's a nice thing. So this Evolution 2021, uh, last time we updated it, it says Devo Arm Group. And I know that uh, Krishna actually presented on this evolution idea he wants to do uh, I can't remember the name of the the actual name of it like this is a I'll just put Krishna's idea because I have it in the other one but I can't remember so the, the Krishna has an idea that he wants to turn into a abstract uh, he was working on some slides but we have to turn this into an abstract um, for submission sake and then uh, there's another one that we talked about, and this was, okay, I want this, I want to put this up here. All right. See, so you see the numbering gets, we'll fix it later. Um, and there's a thing I've been working on uh, this week. It's uh, this thing on um, Euler, I think it was Euler Paths for Life or Euler Networks. So it's like we're using uh, using these minimal systems where it's like a bunch of cells, a bunch of shapes that are kind of contained in a, a single mass and the spaces between the cells form a network. And that network can be traversed according to an Euler path, which means you can only cross one edge once, but you have to cross all the edges. It's basically like the traveling salesman problem, but it's applied to a network graph, uh, the edges of a network graph. So it's not crossing bridges uh, or crossing between islands on bridges. It's actually crossing the edges of a network. And so this is, uh, I gave a presentation on this a while back, and I'll probably give a presentation on it uh, an update on it soon once I get the abstract done, but that's going to be another uh, submission for evolution and um, I'll put actually what I'll do is I'll put some information in the um, Slack channel and I will update everyone on it as, as we will with Krishna's idea maybe a little bit before the deadline and so the deadline for that is March 1st. So that's coming up pretty soon. Um, it's always good to, to keep yourself a couple weeks ahead of these deadlines so that you have time to get your materials in. But this is uh, March 1st. So this is in about two weeks, let's say. And this is something you can submit to this link. So you go to this link and you uh, follow the instructions for submitting a, an abstract. And then that's submitted. And so that's something that we might end up doing. Um, I'm actually also thinking of submitting another version of this Euler Paths uh, work to CompleNet. And so this is uh, a conference, a complex systems conference that is being held online. So we have CompleNet Live 2021. 
if we go to the CompleNet website, yeah, this is an online, net, uh, it's a networks conference, so it's complex networks. Uh, I, I think a lot of you have heard of what those are, but you know, they usually have a lot of different types of research there, uh, a lot of graph theory, a lot of different domains like social systems, biological systems, physics. You know, network started, network, complex network theory started in physics, but they have all sorts of people there. Um, it's very interdisciplinary. So if you're interested in uh, attending that, that's open for participation, but they're also looking for submissions and they're actually looking for papers. So this is going to be a full paper instead of just an abstract. So let me make a note of that. And then this is the abstract here. All right, so that's that's due. Um, I can't remember the deadline on that. Let's see if we can find the deadline. Um, so that would be March 26th. So that's well, coming up in a fair amount of time. We'll see if we can make that. Um, I think it's an eight page paper. So it's, you know, it's not really super long, but it's probably doable. Um, so that's that's that one. Okay, so let's go back up here. Uh, DevoLearn, DevoLearn Flash Talk, OSF Virtual Conference for Online Education. So this is the thing that I'm going to be presenting at tomorrow. This is this, actually, this is the ninth. So this is the ninth at 1 p.m. EST. So if you're interested in this, attending this conference, this is an education conference put on by the Open Science Framework. And it's actually starting today, but uh, presentation I'm giving is tomorrow at 1 p.m. EST. This is the website for the uh, conference. This is uh, Virtual Unconference and Open Scholarship Practices in Education Research. Let me see if I can find the schedule here. Should be down a little bit. Uh, you register here. Uh, this is the schedule, I think. See if it works. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so this is the schedule. So today there are a couple talks on um, preprints. There's a talk on hackathons at 1 p.m. Eastern time. There's uh, let's see what else. They call it an unconference because it's just kind of a very for informal conference. Uh, they have different. Um, sort of specialty talks and different things. Um, then they have lightning talks, which is what I'll be doing tomorrow. And those lightning talks are, you know, pretty diverse. They cover a bunch of different topics in education and open online education. So, you know, everything from multiverse analyses in the classroom to open art histories to uh, copyright on open materials. And then Tomorrow there's uh, more workshops. There's an actual hackathon. So this is like a working session. So that's that's nice to have at a conference because you can follow up on it later. Then the lightning talk. So Devil Learn is in the one o'clock spot and we have a bunch of people here. So the lightning talk should be about five to 10 minutes. Uh, actually about five to eight minutes, but it's, you know, it's fast pace. And so we'll see when I, open the talk, what it looks like. Um, and so yeah, that's, I mean, that might be of interest to some people. So let's go back to the submissions here. So that's, uh, what I'll do is I'll color code this since it's sort of on its way out and presented. So that's, that's completed more or less. And then of course we can follow up on this later, uh, what the product of this was and we can maybe recycle it for other things. So now we have uh, this abstract. I think we've been, uh, a couple of us have been working on it. I think uh, Mayuk and Ojwal and Mainak and Krishna and myself on this uh, growth form and theory of deep learning. And this is, a, I, I didn't actually submit this to the SIA meeting, so I'm not really sure where this is going to be submitted. I didn't think it was a very good venue for it, but um, but this is a, 
it's a I, I think it's probably at this point like an extended abstract on looking at deep learning networks and then looking at how maybe we could use them for developmental biology or in the sense of like uh, simulating developmental biology, not necessarily analysis. So this would be a little bit different from what we do with DevaLearn, uh, the program. And, um, you know, it's, it's a speculative piece, but it's also can maybe lead to some technical advances as well. So this is something we're, we're still kind of thinking about where to submit it. Um, I mean, the, the, you got to find the right venue. Uh, and we could also submit it as a paper, but I think that's going to take a little bit more work. So I think the, maybe a good first step is like a extended abstract type thing. But anyways, we'll, we'll keep working on that. Um, we, haven't, we haven't worked on it in a while, but it's available. So I might actually put this on the list of open papers um, that we might be able to work on. Um, and that's just me putting a link to the draft on um, on the uh, GitHub, in the in the GitHub repo where we have the open papers. Uh, then we have Google Summer Code Various Projects. So that's completed. Uh, that's up on Neurostars. So, and we have to update, of course, what our deadlines are on this. So now the deadline isn't uh, no longer February 1st. I think that, uh, I don't know when the actual applications open, but the applications I don't think open until the end of the month. And then I think the end of March is when they uh, actually open the application period and then that goes to March 30th. So, you know, we have some time there. We'll be engaging with students and hopefully students will come to the meetings and, and interact. And then, you know, we usually have some good outcomes from that. People get selected for the projects. If they don't get selected for the projects, they usually are able to do something in the group. And it's, it's always, you know, it's always a positive thing to be involved in. Um, the next thing is, is this Bacillary Non-Neuronal Cognition paper. So this is something that we put out a, uh, we put out a proposal for, and it was a short, maybe three page thing, and that was accepted. And now we have to produce a paper by the end of April. So this is, it seems like a lot of work, but we actually have a lot of the parts in place, which is we just need to like kind of move them uh, forward. Oh, hi, Shruti, how are you? I see Shruti's here. So, uh, uh, hi Bradley. I'm so sorry I was a little late today. Um, I was stuck in traffic actually. Oh, that's fine. Are Are you uh, prepared to give a talk today? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I will. Okay, maybe we'll do that next. I'm gonna finish up with this uh, submissions list. Yeah, absolutely no problem. Yeah. So this. So if you're interested in being involved in this, you can, it can get. You know, maybe I'll put some more information into the Slack channel soon and we can start to move on this paper. So this paper, um, we gave a talk at NeuroMatch conference on non-neuronal cognition with a focus on basal area. So we've already got some of the work done. We just need to get this together into a paper and maybe get some feedback on, you know, what we should cover, what we shouldn't cover, you know, some, there, there are a lot of things to do. So well, I'll, I'll be updating people on that. Uh, the C. Elleg International C. Elegans Conference is coming up March 25th. That's the deadline for the uh, abstract submissions. And then the conference is this summer, and it's going to be on, it's going to be virtual online. Uh, and this is the big C. Elegans Conference that everyone goes to every other year. So every other year there's a C. elegans conference. It's it's biologically oriented, like towards people doing C. elegans biology. So, you know, the computational topics are a bit sparse maybe, um, but it doesn't mean that they won't, you know, maybe you won't get accepted into a session. Um, so you have to submit an abstract uh, there's a, oh, there's a fee for abstract submission. I don't know why, but, well, we may or may not do this. I don't know. Uh, but anyways, we'll, we'll 
well, if you're interested in, in doing this, we'll talk about it. I haven't, I know a couple years ago, the uh, Openworm group, uh, the larger Openworm group, they submitted, or actually they had a workshop on machine learning. So I think it was in, I um, can't remember what year it was. I think it was 2017 or maybe 2019. Uh, they had a, uh, a session on machine learning. They had a session on machine learning at NeurIPS as well, but they have they have uh, engaged with this community. So this is something that is, it's a little pricey to, to attend, I, I believe, but uh, it's a place to make some connections if you're interested in C. elegans research. Um, the the Diva Learn paper, we're still working on that. I, that deadline's passed. I was thinking maybe we could submit that to a conference or maybe to a, uh, as a preprint, maybe as a journal article, but I don't know. So this was the one that was the one we were going to submit to uh, the Journal of Open Source Software, but that didn't happen. They weren't interested in it. Uh, so, we're, you know, we can expand it out and maybe make it into a preprint or submit it to a, uh, some venue. If you have ideas of places you'd like to submit it, uh, let me know. I can put it in the list. We can try aim for it. And if it doesn't make it, we can just find another venue. That's the thing about this list, too, is we can put in uh, different things that we're working on and try to find match them to venues and uh, or put venues on and match them to papers. So keep that in mind. Finally, this this complement thing I mentioned. So that's that's and then again, we can add to this list as we go along. So please, uh, if you have something to add to the list, uh, please put it in the Slack channel and I'll try to add it in when we can. So we have some uh, let's see, we have some things in the chat. Uh, so, oh yes, about the periodicity paper. So, uh, I think Jesse and and uh, or uh, Ojwal have committed to the periodicity paper revisions. So we have, uh, and I'll talk about this more when we talk about the papers. Uh, we have some. We have the periodicity paper. It's been reviewed. It's pretty. The reviews are pretty positive. So we have to respond to the reviews by March first. We have some. Uh, the one big thing we're looking for are animations of embryogenesis in zebrafish or sea elegans and so we have maybe have some candidates for that but um, other than that there's a lot of editing that needs to be done and things like that so we'll go over that maybe next week um, and then we also have this other project in and uh, i'm trying to organize uh, or, organize this project on neural organoids and so i haven't mentioned neural organoids here yet but uh, it's an initiative we're trying to start up. So neural organoids are these, uh, they're not really embryos. They're, you know, they're, they're like basically neural stem cells that you grow in, in big, uh, groups of cells. Uh, you can grow them in a 3d medium or you can grow them on a scaffold and they basically, you, you grow them as a bunch of these neural stem cells and they, sometimes they differentiate into different layers of, of, uh, you know, different layers that you can, uh, that are actually are functional, but they're, you know, you have to use, uh, you have to use certain media, you have to use certain substrates to grow them on, but you can get some uh, systems that sort of approximate a developing nervous system. And so it's a, it's a fascinating area, but the thing is it's uh, very open because it's a very new area. So there are a bunch of groups working on this in the world, maybe about 20 or 30, and uh, we're trying to organize some literature around like what they've been doing. We're trying to find a niche to do computational analysis. A sample of an organoid. Uh, you mean like a biological sample or just like what they look like? Because I mean, I can I can share pictures of it. I don't know. If I have a paper right now, but I can actually get some pictures of it. Oh, biological sample. Well, I think the there you know there are groups that it's, it's specialized. Uh, they have a specialized lab set up for growing organoids, and I think like uh, the, you know if you just I don't know if you inquire to a lab, they may not, may or may not be cooperative in sending you things. I think it's more that you have to grow them from scratch then you can actually get samples. I don't know how the 
it actually works. Um, I don't know how the, like I know the protocols are pretty specific and yeah, so I can actually share some pictures maybe next week. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe I'll put some together because we have a, you know, we, we can just t take them out of some of the papers or uh, I'm sure they'll, well, I'll get into it. Yeah, I think I thought it would be of interest to this group. So we'll we'll look into it next week and then I'll get I'll get some pictures of that. But just to give people a heads up, it's something we're trying to organize. Um, maybe I'll talk about it next week and we'll uh, do a little bit more on that. And then finally, can we put the link to the submission submission sheet in the Slack? Yeah, I'll put it in the Slack. Actually, I can put this list in the chat, and then you can ask for permissions. But I'll, then I'll put it in the Slack later on today. It may already be in the Slack. I can pin it to the channel as well. So that's the Google Doc for that. So uh, why don't we move to Shruti and? Uh, but as in she give her talk, and then I'll return to the flash talk after that. Um, all right, so can I share the screen now? Yes. Um, is it visible? Yes, yes. Um, all right. So recently I've been working on art generation. Art generation uh, basically uses a technique which is called neural style transfer. Uh, neural style transfer can be used to generate an output image that is based on the stuff that is shown in what we call the content image. But the styling and the feel of the image is more from the style image. It can be called like a filter. But how is it different from a filter? Let me tell you that first. In filters, what we do is basically uh, we either manipulate the pixels or we add another filter on the existing image so as to get all these various effects that you, that you can see with no filters and all this. Uh, but in neural, uh, neural art generation, the technique which I have used, it basically exploits the way in which layers add different lengths of the CNN extra features. Like in the last week's session which we talked about, uh, Manik was talking about ResNet 50 and the model is made on uh, ResNet 18. So the difference is in, in the number 18 and 50 and that's the number of layers. So if we increase the number of layers, there are more features that the model can learn. It can, you know, try to extract all the small details in the image which we have. So that is what it is doing, trying to, uh, this, this model particularly, what is doing, it is doing that. The initial layer will look at the simpler features like it does in any CNN, like the edges, maybe the color, etc. And as we go deeper into the network, the layer tries to look at the more complex features, like the texture, the shape and all this. So from all this, we can say that the initial layer gives us the style of the image and the later ones give us the content of the image and that's what exactly we want the style for painting and our image. Uh, so this is what it is, a content image and a style image. When they put, uh, they put together, they give us an output image. So now all this I've told you, so how do we know that if the generated image has the content of the image, for example, your face, and the style of the style image, in that example, a Mona Lisa painting. For all this, we have a loss function, but since we have two images to be compared with, like the content image and the style image, so there need to be two losses. Uh, so all this is fine, what is actually happening? Um, so before the next slide, I will say that I have taken the liberty of taking Susan your picture online and branding your picture online and trying to generate some art out of it. So I hope you guys like it. This is, this is Susan's picture which I found online and I tried to see how it would look like if Leonardo da Vinci, uh, if he would have not painted Mona Lisa, but he would have painted Susan and this is what the output of the model is. This is the output that we get from the model. You can see that in the, in the previous one you have some strokes and you know some irregularities and you can see that strokes in the image. Uh, I trained this for around 150 epochs and this is what it came about. If I increase the number of epochs then Susan was not very recognizable so I kept it to this much. So this is Kind of what, not exactly what Leonardo da Vinci would have done, but maybe if I would have better GP, it would have looked more beautiful. But Susan, you still look very beautiful in this picture. And then I took Bradley. This is the process, like uh, you can see from the starting, how it, first of all, just try to you know find out the colors and gradually 
it tried to incorporate the style without losing the fact that it is Susan in the picture and no one else. So that is where we need to find a sweet point where we know that the person in the image or the object is recognizable and yet the style too remains here. So the style, like you see, is because of the initial layers which we have taken from the style image, that is uh, Mona Lisa's image and the content that is Susan is taken from the content image and that too from the deeper sections. Uh, so I took one more example, this is a little Bradley switch which I found and I tried it to put on this painting, the girl with the pearl and uh, you can, this is what it generated. You can see there is a difference between uh, Susan's image and Bradley's image. Susan's image was more close and you know there were more strokes here and this one is a bit more smoother. I think the color scheme is not uh, that good right now, I, maybe it would have required more training, uh, but yeah, this is how it would have be done. Like uh, this first particular, this is different from the uh, filters which we have used till now. Uh, that is because in that, what we do was just fix a manipulation. We would increase the brightness or decrease the brightness, normalize it, or add some filter on top of it. But we never uh, transferred the style. An app called Prisma came, uh, I guess, two four two four years before, which did use the exact same technique. It used to take two pictures and take some time and give us an image of a particular style, and that used the exact same art generation with the help of neural side transfer. So I guess this was a good way of, you know, knowing how images, uh, how a neural network or a CNN in particular understands images. The, the starting one is for the color and the style and the last one are for the object or the person who is in the image. So yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Let me see what we have in terms of questions. Oh, Susan, she liked it. She was put a laughing... Uh... <laughs> and then Mayuk and Mayuk both clapped. So there you go. Thank you so much. So could you uh, share your screen again? I wanted to go look at the slides a little bit more. Sure, sure. Just yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So go back to the maybe some of the uh, mm -hmm. image, like Susan's image, and then we can go uh, forward. The generated to the, image or yeah, the, the generated image. Yeah. So this is like. So the the algorithm the algorithm's doing is it's picking up the strokes of the original painting, mm -hmm. and then sort of putting it on top of, as sort of like yeah. a, a a mask of the yeah, original image. Uh, it's not the mask. The masks are what we initially find um, in the filters which we use normally on our phones, right? That is the mask. This is not the mask. This is what it's doing. It's manipulating the pixels in such a way. Uh, basically, the output image, initially, it's nothing. It's an uh, image with garbage values. And each and every pixel is generated in such a way that it takes, like, for example, Sus in Susan's image, what I did, I had to do particularly was to uh, increase the amount of, you know, content that had to be there. We have a content weight in the model and we have a style weight like how much more preference we need to get. If I had put the content weight a little less, so Susan was becoming a little blurred and everything was becoming, you know, quite a shaggy. Uh, so here, uh, there is a new generated image. It's not a mask on any previous one. It's a third image that's generated all from the beginning, where it starts with random pixel values and slowly generates it. Like uh, in this, you can see, right, so what it had done was in the first image, the content was to the maximum point and slowly and slowly uh, the style took over. Okay. And so, yeah, so it's learning the style and it's sort of generating new images that are in mm -hmm. that style. Um, yeah, and then if you go to my image with my, my train generated image, yeah. So yeah, that, that's doing this sort of a similar thing there. Mm -hmm. So if you if you train, how long if you go out like about? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, at some point it converges if you overtrain the model. Say, yeah. what happens? Yeah, exactly. Then was overtraining the model. The point was that uh, you could not see the features. Then basically, initially the content is what is uh, in more concentration. As you train it further and further. The style overpowers the content and you cannot recognize the person. So, you, like for example, your image, I trained it for 300 epochs and Susan's was around 180, I guess. Uh, around 180, after 180 epochs, Susan's image was becoming a little blurry. Uh, and, uh, up, but yours went up to 300 epochs and then I, what is what I got. And after that, it was becoming a little, 
you know, you will never get the hazard after that. So you need to see till what is the appropriate uh, size and appropriate length of the epoxy which you need to use. It's very good. Very good. Um, and so what did you use for this? What? What, uh, uh, I used the VGG uh, 16 network for this uh, because it had uh, you know, 16 layers and what we had to do was take the initial convolution layer for uh, the uh, side image and the later, later convolution layers for the uh, content image because it is already pre-trained model so it was easier for us to train this image on that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? I think training it for a little longer time would, uh, you know, maybe make it better if we use a bigger network. But yeah, the resources are limited right now, and I'm on cloud, so this was this uh, training your image to the wrong. Uh, two to three hours, uh, Bradley, and Susan's was like one and a half hours. So yeah, it took a little time, and you know, changing the parameters again and again would uh, take more time. So yeah, 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 that works good. Thank you. So yes, yeah. thank you very much, Rudy. Um, if people are interested in giving a talk, oh, my knock, would you like to say something? Yeah, so see, the first thing that I want to say is that whatever Shruti did, that's really nice. And the second thing is that Shruti, uh, like, are you, uh, uh, did you use Colab or any other sort of GPU? Yeah, like, I used Colab. Because it usually used... takes a very long time. Yeah, I used Colab. Uh, I was trying on my own system, but it was taking a more time, and so I used Colab for this. Yeah, so then maybe you can share the code with us, so it would be really interesting Definitely. to check it out. Yeah, yeah I'll share yeah, absolutely, yeah. Actually, absolutely, thanks. Absolutely, yeah. If you wanted to push it to the, uh, we have a data science demos repo on um, DevoLearn, and if you want to push it there, it would be good. Um, we have like a bunch yeah. of demos there f for all sorts of different topics, um, so that would actually be a good place to share it. Um, all right, yeah. I can do that there. Okay, very good. And um, so if anyone wants to give a talk on something, it doesn't have to be machine learning, it can be some other area that we do in the group here, uh, please let me know, um, you know, that. so this is a good example. It's very good. Um, Minak, would you like to say something? Yeah, so actually, you were speaking of talks, right? So like uh, I was working on the new update uh, I was actually working on a new upgrade for uh, DevoLearn so uh, I think I had given a presentation last week uh, regarding the new regarding the new uh, larger uh, data set right? yes. so I, I actually had trained it I actually had trained the new model and it's showing better results and uh, like I see I've compared both my model and the current model on the repo now and it's showing it's it's actually showing slightly better results. So maybe I'll send a PR this week and I'll be giving a short talk on it next week in next week's meeting. Okay, that sounds good. All right. So that's okay, right? Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, great. Yeah, and uh, yeah, like I said, if anyone wants to give a talk, just let me know, uh, and we'll put it on the schedule. So, um, oh, we have two more things. Okay. Oh yeah, Google Colab is a savior. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's a very nice tool to have. You can share code. Uh, so let me go into the Flash talk now, and I, I'm going to give a. It's going to be a pretty high level talk on. So I've been taught. We've been talking about DevoLearn as the plat as like a standalone program, but we also it's also a platform, and I'll show you what that looks like. So this is the. If you can see my screen. Okay, so this is the talk, uh, DevoLearn, Engaging Learners with Computational Developmental Biology. So this is the uh, links to the uh, website and the DevoWorm GitHub, which isn't DevoLearn, but it's like the main DevoWorm uh, GitHub site. 
And so this is a list of our open source contributors, which will grow. Uh, but this is, you know, this is as of like last night. Uh, we have a lot of people. Um, and we're adding people all the time to the uh, to the repo. These are all the people who have uh, filed a pull request with the organization. So we did some, we have some core contributors here in the group who attend the meetings. We had people who participated in Hacktoberfest and all those people are listed and there are people coming in all the time in different ways. Um, so Diva Worm Group as a, as a whole is devoted to building the world's first digital C. elegans embryo, although, you know, we're, we're focused on other organisms, other model systems as well. Uh, Open Worm Foundation, of course, is we're, what we're affiliated with for the aspect of building a sort of a digital model of a C. elegans embryo or a generalized embryo. Uh, we, uh, you know, look at the nematode C. elegans and other uh, model organisms using simulation analysis and visualization. And we deal a lot with a lot of secondary and tertiary data sets, which are uh, data sets that have been processed and made available publicly. So there's all sorts of data. We focus on segmented microscopy data, public repositories and literature mining, among other things. And so one of the things we're interested in is deep learning and quantitative morphology. And so on the right, you see this example of C. elegans embryogenesis being segmented into individual cells and then into these uh, cell centroids, which represent like not the nucleus of the cell, but the center of one of these uh, segmented cells. And so we can track those things in space and in time as they divide and are born. We also can use theory building to explain developmental processes. So explaining how we go from a sphere to this asymmetrical cow. And you can see in this GIF that it's sort of a, I mean, that's sort of an idealized process, but that's what we're interested in. And then we're also looking at things like bacillary cell colony morphology. So this is a little bit beyond conventional development, but we're looking at applying these techniques to other systems and understanding things like movement and other, other phenomena. So we started with Diva Worm ML, which was a course on machine learning in... Hello? Hello? What was that? Oh. Okay. Uh, so we started with Diva Worm ML, and this was something that happened in 2019 in the fall. And it was a course on machine learning that had a specific bent towards developmental biology. So we brought together machine learning and developmental biology. Uh, you know, this was totally online. This was amongst our group, but we invited people in to give talks and other blog posts and things like that. We actually produced a group blog post on pre-trained models, which then turned into the DevoLearn platform. And this was a way we could engage with the broader community uh, under this data science theme, under this machine learning theme. Uh, then this, of course, turned into our one of our uh, projects for Google Summer of Code 2020, uh, where we uh, worked on something called the DevoZoo, but also on these pre-trained models. So we have the, uh, we upgraded our, our secondary data uh, portal called DevoZoo, but we also started to build on these pre-trained models. And so the pre-trained models were done by Myok Deb, and he produced this DevoLearn 0.2.0 release, which is a pre-trained model for C. elegans embryos. Uh, Ojwal Singh also produced this uh, upgrade to the DevoZoo uh, repository, which is a collection of data sets, which one might use then to plug into something like DevoLearn. And so the way we do this, Google Summer of Code is a, a core thing in our, our educational pipeline. So we have this, uh, one of the things we do is we prepare students uh, for the Google Summer Code application period. There's this education and evaluation pipeline that we have. Uh, we find a call for involvement. We contribute to a GitHub issue, or we have them contribute to a GitHub issue during the application period. 
and then they can join weekly meetings and get involved in bigger projects. So you can see it's sort of a, a way to get, you know, the call for involvement is a way to get people into this educational and research infrastructure. And on the right, you can see the Devo Learn GitHub organization where we have the Devo Learn software, but we have other things like data science demos and the general biological model. So there are all sorts of activities under this umbrella that we're working on alongside DevilLearn. DevilLearn, of course, being the software being the most developed of those. So right now we're at DevilLearn 0.2.3, and that is uh, uh, the latest release of DevilLearn. Uh, DevilLearn, the program, is a standalone program. It uses pre-trained deep learning models, in this case ResNet, for analyzing microscopy images. And so um, it needs a number of things. It needs maybe uh, larger data sets for training. So we're always trying to find data sets to improve the training on it. Uh, we're trying to make more advances in the GUI and the way people interact with it and better benchmarks. And we have a project in Google Summer Code this summer to uh, build upon our success with this platform. And this is, of course, a sort of a, a schematic of the GitHub source and the user environment in this program as it stands right now. So we have a lot of functionality built in already, but we're looking to expand it out. Uh, but then we also have this platform. So we not only have, uh, and I need to change this, uh, we not only have the uh, standalone pro uh, platform, released as open open source software, but we have this umbrella of things. So we have two other things here I'd like to highlight, species specific models, and that's what we call Devil Worm AI, which they're programs that allow us to analyze different, um, different other model organisms and in different, you know, using different models other than the ResNet. And then we also have DevoZoo, which is a collection of data, and those can be found um, at devorm.github.io. So this is Devorm AI. This is the splash page for it. We have here a number of specialized programs for different uh, model organisms. We have uh, links to the Devo Zoo, which is a place where we store uh, data sets for students or other collaborators to engage with to start to analyze and start to understand what's going on. Uh, we also look at a number of different uh, we, so we have access to a number of different uh, development in a number of different species. So we have C. elegans, of course, which is the place we started with all of this. And then we have uh, also acquired data from Drosophila, from zebrafish, and from spider embryos. And there are many more uh, other types of model organisms. We'd like to incorporate their uh, plant models where you look at plant embryos their ant embryos, and there are other types of embryos that are specialized that maybe aren't model organisms, but we'd like to understand anyways. And so this is what this platform allows you to do is to, you know, uh, find a model organism, maybe analyze something that isn't like, we don't have a lot of knowledge about it. We might use one set of models, but we might use a pre-trained model for something like C. elegans, where there is a lot of outstanding data and we can get a sense of what, you know, we can do a lot of things. It's a very diverse uh, platform. That's what we're aiming for. And so we have a lot of things as, as part of this Devil Worm or Devil Learn uh, umbrella. We have a lot of things that are being developed by contributors as well as the main group. Uh, contributors meaning like people from just from interactions through GitHub or through the Open Worm Slack versus the people who join the group on a regular basis. So we have data science demos. We just saw a demonstration of that right just previous to me talking. Uh, we do this in Jupyter notebooks or Colab notebooks. We have methodological tutorials and the like. So we're trying to engage people in terms of data science education. We're trying to engage people in more general education with respect to teaching computational students about developmental biology and vice versa. And then we have this theory building aspect, which is building explanatory frameworks and hypotheses for the data that we're generating. So we're generating data, or we're generating analysis of data, or sometimes we're even generating data, and then we're analyzing it. And then we have to understand that analysis. 
And so that's where the theory building comes in. Thank you. So that would be the talk. I think it's a little more than five minutes in that, but I wanted to kind of go through it to show people where we are with that. There's Krishna. Okay, so Asaf had to leave. Thank you for attending Asaf. Uh, Krishna is busy with the paper. You just drop it. Say hello. Hello, uh, Krishna. Hello. Hi. So, um, so I guess the last, and again, if you have to leave at the top of the hour, that's fine, but I wanted to go over some papers um, to for the week. Let's see. Okay. So the first thing... Uh, I'm going to talk about here is I did find a zebrafish embryo um, semi like it's a it's a video from the Fabian lab at USC and this is one of the zebrafish embryo where the cells are migrating it's a time-lapse video so we're looking for something like this uh, for the paper for the periodicity in the embryo paper and I'm not sure if this is something we can use. This is the Zebrafish Rock uh, Twitter account, and they had this was something they posted yesterday: a neural crest cell migration in a zebrafish embryo. Credit to the Peter Fabian lab. So that's an example of a video that we might want to use for our periodicity in the embryo paper. So that's. I just wanted to give you a taste of that. Um, the other thing I wanted to go, oh yeah, I wanted to also say that there's, I put up a, uh, an announcement for the Summer Code Projects on Twitter. Here's, we have INCF, Openworm, and Orthogonal Lab, and DevoWorm are all involved in this initiative, getting people involved in these different projects. So you can see they're linked to the NeuroStars wow. descriptions, and hopefully people will respond to this. Uh, I mean, just trying to advertise it as many places as possible. Um, oh, okay, I do have a paper on the organoids. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the organoids. Er, this this is one, one paper on organoids. This is a review of the uh, embryoids, organoids, and gastroloids. New approaches to understanding embryogenesis. So this is a review of organoids. And uh, I'm going to present more in more detail on this uh, maybe next week. But I wanted to show this just to give you a taste of what it is. So organoids are, here's a, this A panel is an organoid and then they compare it to gastroloids and embryoids. So an organoid is where you have MESCs, which are stem cells, and they're dissociated into a 3000 cell cluster. And then you put it into this uh, medium with minimal growth factors. And this is a big thing with uh, growth factors are very important in cultivating organoids, but I don't think anyone has the right formula. They just try to try different things. But uh, you'll see it's a big it's a big controversy in the field. And so they create these 3000 cell clusters. They put them in the media. They put them in like either a bioreactor, which is a big vat, or they put them on a scaffold which is usually some surface where they might grow it into something like an ear or a heart valve or something like that. And then they let them grow. And you end up, at, by day five, you start to get this sort of uh, apical and basal sections of the organoid. And then you get this something, like in this case, they're growing an optic cup. So you start to get this optic cup emerge. And then by day nine, you see this thing and this is, stain, this is stained GFP. So you can see there's this, these two, uh, it has two layers in it. So it's kind of hard to see from this image, but that's basically the idea. You're growing these, these masses of cells and you're trying to differentiate them into different things. And it's, I know it seems a little bit magical, but there's a lot of hardcore, like wet lab work that goes into this. And again, I'll, I'll give more information about that next week. So there are a lot of things that you can see, like you can examine a lot of self-organization self and patterning in these uh, organoids. In, in the neural organoids, you get like 
you know, different layers of neurons, and you can differentiate them in that way. But you can also observe a lot of pattern formation and self-organization. You can do a lot of experiments with physics and cells. So you can look at the tension and adhesive strength between cells. You can look at the way they polarize in uh, sort of in an anatomical context. You can look at things like lumen formation, uh, look at the mechanical influences, and also look at geometric confinement, which is something that we can do in, in cell culture, but you know, I think this allows you to uh, culture a lot more cells uh, at one time. So it allows you to build these tissues, basically. Um, and then, uh, and again, it's very early on in this science, so it's hard to kind of know, you know, what the, it's kind of hard to show really good results. Um, a lot of the papers out there are basically on, like, how to grow them and maybe some cool things we can do with them. So I'll give a talk on that more next week. Um, I think Susan sent me this paper, C. elegans is a model organism. And this is, uh, uh, this is an article on what, you know, sort of the relevance of C. elegans as a model organism. So it's not a mammalian model, but we can use it as a way to look at sort of the physiological properties of an animal. We can replicate human diseases. And because it has a fast life cycle, we can do things like experimental evolution, or we can look at the life history of the organism without spending, you know, a lot of time on a single subject. And so, you know, you can study things like human diseases ranging from Parkinson's disease to mitochondrial diseases, immune system diseases. Uh, and so this is actually a lot of stuff they talk about at the C. elegans meeting. Um, and this is a very basic uh, description of C. elegans as a model organism. So maybe if, you know, a lot of people are coming in as computational people, they might want to read this article as a way to sort of get up to speed on some of the potential for C. elegans. Um, it has some nice references at the end. And so this is a nice article. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, what else I want to talk about? Uh, then there's this paper uh, continuing down the road of C. elegans um, and development. We have this paper, Animal Systems Biology, Towards a Systems View of Development in C. elegans. This was published in 2009, and it's a nice paper on sort of thinking about C. elegans as a systems model. Um, again, like it's a it's a animal model where we can study a lot of biomedicine. But we also, it's also a system, and, and there's a systems level biology that can be done here. Um, so the nematode worm C. elegans is the preeminent model for understanding animal development at a systems level. Embryonic development in particular has been studied intensively in C. elegans, and genes essential for early stages of embryogenesis and their specific phenotypes have been cataloged comprehensively. Combining these data sets with genome scale studies of gene expression and protein-protein interaction leads to modular views of how genes and their products collaborate to control fundamental processes in early development. Studying groups of genes as functional modules allow the higher order relationships between different biological processes to be observed and suggests how different events during development are coordinated. Here we review the systems level approaches that have been used to study the early development in C. elegans and how these are deepening our understanding of complex molecular programs underlying development. So they, they kind of go through why C. elegans is a model for development. Um, and part of that is because it's a very simple organism in the sense that it has cells that we know what they're going to become uh, as they divide. We know kind of what their fate is going to be. We can draw a fate tree, you know, we can draw a tree of different cell fates. They call it a lineage tree, but the lineage tree is deterministic, as they call it. Uh, it also has, adults have the same number of cells. Uh, de well, depending whether it's a male or hermaphrodite, there's a different number there. But any one C. elegans is going to have a certain number of cells in an adult, unless it's a mutant, in, in which case it will maybe have a few more or a few less cells. But it's very, pretty much consistent. So we can track all of that. And this is why we use it in, in open worm as well, because 
you know, it's something pretty predictable as a system. And so from this, we can do things like single cell sequencing. We can do other types of uh, studies of development. We can do knockouts of development. So we can knock out genes and we can, we know kind of what the effect is much more clearly than maybe in something like a mouse. And so all these things are very powerful, uh, allow you to do very powerful things in, in the, working with your organism. So they're looking at building towards a phenome map of C. elegans embryogenesis. So this is, remember, this is 2009. So this is well before we started working on this or anyone else really thought about this stuff uh, as a, a phenome. I mean, people were working on C. elegans since the 60s, but this, this view is not that old. Um, so there's there have been a number of attempts to try to build, um, you know, these type of holistic models of C. elegans and, you know, they've had very, have been a varying success. Um, so the good kind of walks through development of C. elegans here, cellular phenomena during early embryogenesis. So it really, really gets deep in the weeds on this stuff. So if you're interested in learning about like very specific events in development, this is a good paper to read. Um, so they, they actually have some good like microscopy here of the embryo. So this is the embryo at the two cell stage, which is where you get the basic uh, anatomical poles between the anterior and posterior ends. And these are the two major cell lineages, P1 and AB. So when you, uh, if you've been working on the machine learning and you've seen, seen those, uh, you know, letters representing, you know, letters of representing different cell sublineages, that's what these look like. These are two sublineages, AB and P1. And then you get to the, this is the four cell. So this is like two AB cells. And this is like two P1 cells. And those form sublineages. And then the eight cell, I think, is where you have your basic eight founder cells. So once you get to those, you get those sublineages. So you have four AB sublineages and four P1 sublineages that then are used in the nomenclature. Um, those are like major events of differentiation. And in the AB line sublineages, you have a lot of muscle cells, a lot of, um, you know, other types of cells. And then you have in the uh, P1 lineages, you have the germline, you have very specific muscle cells, you have uh, other types of very specialized cell types in the gut and things like that. And so uh, a lot of these things are defined right from that point in development. And so you get a lot more cell proliferation. You end up with this comma period, which is where the uh, you start to get a deformation in this basic spherical shape. And then you finally get to something that looks like this just before the egg hatches, which is where the, at the uh, larval worm is all curled up and ready to unfurl. And so that's what the developmental process looks like. And then they get into genes, which are, if you're not a geneticist, it's a little bit daunting uh, to understand this, uh, you know, the different uh, uh, symbols that they use for genes. But I think they def they define some of this in here. And they go through this. They go through reverse genetic approaches. And they go through forward genetic approaches. I don't know if they actually go through that too much depth, but they're forward and reverse genetic approaches, which um, allow you to either look at genes by sort of examining their mutations or knocking genes, they're knocking them out functionally and then looking at their effects. And so there are ways to do this, there are techniques, and they kind of go through these techniques. They use something called RNAi, which is a way to knock down gene expression, so that's also used. And they go through that, which is a little bit, it's a older tech now. I don't know how much they use it anymore, but it was a big deal about 15 years ago. Um, there are all these tools that are constantly circulating in molecular biology. So getting into all those tools is, is harrowing, actually. But, <laughs> uh, you know, if you read this, I think you get a sense of like some of the things that people are doing to, to control gene expression to study you know, mutants and, and study phenotypes and things like that. Um, 
So a bird's eye view of the embryonic phenome, global trends. And so they kind of go through the trends here for looking at some of these reverse uh, genetic studies and looking at the, one thing that C. elegans is really good for is looking at mutants, specific mutants to specific genes. So you can knock out a specific gene and you can see a specific phenotypic outcome. Like, you know, there might be a metabolic gene you knock out and it has an effect on growth. A lot of those things exist and they have them all cataloged and you can actually get mutants of that specific uh, knocked out genotype and you can grow them up and you can observe these effects. And so it's, it's really a really nice system for that. That's another reason why it's very good for looking at disease because you can knock out different genes. Uh, so, you know, that might be like homologs of things in humans and get an understanding of how they function. So, and then they cluster phenotypes. They have a lot of stuff in this paper. Uh, data integration towards a system's view of early embryogenesis. So they're putting together data here. Um, this is a very nice paper. Um, definitely, if I were inter if you're interested in that, in kind of understanding some of that depth of C. elegans, uh, what's going on in the C. elegans community, I would read that paper. Um, finally, I think I'll just bring your attention to this paper. Actually, this is uh, this isn't in the paper itself, but this is a press release on this. So there's this. Uh, this is actually quite recent, December 23, 2020. Novel computational tool can systematically analyze cell images in C. elegans. And so there's a group out of City University of Hong Kong who's developed a novel computational tool that can reconstruct and visualize three-dimensional shapes and temporal changes in cells. And so the this is, uh, what are they using here? So this is a paper in Nature Communications called Establishment of a Morphological Analysis of the C. elegans embryo using deep learning based 4D segmentation. So they're using this tool called C Shaper. And uh, it's a powerful computational tool that can segment and analyze cell images systematically at the single cell level. And so this is much needed for the study of cell division and cell and gene functions. Uh, and they mentioned the bottleneck in analyzing a lot of the data of s that related to cell division. So there's a lot of data out there, but it's hard to know. You know, it you know it's hard to analyze it all, and hard to analyze it deeply because, you know, you can do things like put a marker on a cell and look at how it splits apart, and you know, uh, but but there's so much detail in cell division, from what's going on inside the cell to sort of its position. Uh, in the environment to the walls of the cell, how they change. So there's a lot of information there. Um, what they're doing here is they're actually, um, okay, what I think they're doing here is they're actually looking for, they're doing some specific experiments. Uh, they're, they're knocking out a DNA sequence, which is what we mentioned in the last paper. They sort of describe how that works. Uh, then they compare two lineage trees that are generated from like a wild type, which is the one without any sort of changes to the DNA sequences. And then they compare that to the knockout where a gene has been removed. And sometimes that will change the lineage tree or the order of division in the cells. And so this will allow you to infer maybe gene functions or changes in how the cells are dividing. And so they're able to generate a bunch of data and this team is analyzing it. So they're analyzing, uh, yeah, so they're using segment, uh, they're using this technology to segment the cell images that are generated from these uh, experiments. Um, they're actually using time-lapse 3D images, which is what they refer to as 4D images. So this is again, you know, this is like getting it from movies, but it's not. Uh, they're just kind of looking at time and differences in time. So the, you know, the way in which you deal with this flow of time and development is, is kind of important. And I don't think people have really thought about that too much. I think it's something people are just kind of trying different things on. So it's hard to know like what the, um, the, you know, this is something we can talk about further, but this fourth dimension, this time dimension of, of image, uh, Segmentation images is actually 
maybe maybe an essential part of this. Image segmentation is a critical process in computer vision that involves involves dividing a visual input into segments. But researchers have spent hundreds of hours labeling many cell images manually. So the state of the art maybe 30 years ago was to label cells manually and then to track them using like very simple rudimentary algorithms. And so now we're able to do this you know, with advanced techniques in a few hours, uh, relatively speaking. And so this, uh, the deep learning based model DMAP-NET developed by the team plays a key role in the C-Shaper system. They're able to capture multiple discrete distances using image pixels. EMAPnet extracts the membrane contour while considering the shape information rather than just intensity features. Uh, so C Shaper has achieved 95.95% accuracy on identifying cells, which we know in advance what the cell should be in the, in the embryo in C. elegans. And this outperformed other methods substantially. And so they're able to generate a time-lapse 3D analysis of cell morphology from the four to 350 cell stages, including cell shape, volume, surface area, migration, nucleus position, and cell-cell contact. So that's pretty good. Um, it get, gets a lot of information out of the cells. Um, I don't know, the best of our knowledge, C-Shaper is the first computational system for segmenting and analyzing the images of C. elegans embryo systematically at the single cell level. I think there are people working on this though, like other people, so. We won't, uh, uh, through close collaboration with biologists, we've been able to develop a more useful tool. And so this is just kind of promoting this platform. They've also tested C shaper and plant cell tissue, plant tissue cells showing promising results. So this is, uh, I'm not gonna get into the paper, but that's basically the idea of the paper. And if you're interested they, in this, uh, they cite that paper in this article. So. I mean, let me put this in the chat, and I'll put this uh, these papers in the um, in the Slack channel as well. So, can you share the link to the zebrafish time lapse video from the Fabian Lab? Yeah, I'll put that in the Slack channel. Um, yeah, then so that's a I think probably a better place. Although it's also in this drive folder, if you want to go in there and get it. So, thank you for attending the meeting. Um, I think that's all for today. Uh, thank you, Shruti, for present, presenting on the uh, on the art uh, on your art project, and uh, please push that to our uh, DevoLearn repository. And um, hopefully, we have some more uh, participation on the DevoLearn platform in general. And um, if you have any questions, let me know on Slack. I'll post some of the readings on Slack for people. So. Um, Otherwise, uh, have a good week and talk to you. See you on Slack or next week in the meeting. All right. Bye, everyone. Take care. Take care.